So I want to go over this situation. Let me go ahead and start this thing uh, moving here just because it's fun. This is Newton's cradle. And, and I want to show you about collisions, elastic collisions, inelastic collisions uh, with some math, but not too much math. And at the end, I'm going to make a model for uh, Newton's cradle like this. You know, really the question is, why does one ball come out and when one ball hits? It's kind of a cool thing. Let's get started. So imagine that I have a slide. There's my slide. Uh, so um, when we think about collisions, momentum is the most important thing. So suppose I have a mass. Here's my mass, and it's moving to the left. Okay, that, it doesn't really matter, but I picked it moving to the left. And I exert a force on it to the right. Then how do I describe the motion of this object? Well, the most important thing is this idea of momentum. We define momentum, we use the, the symbol P, as the product of mass and velocity. Now, force is a vector. Momentum is a vector and velocity is a vector. Just remember that because it is important later on, even though I'm going to try to uh, set up situations uh, for which we can deal with it not as a vector. We'll, we'll limit it to one dimension in a little bit. Okay, so with that, I have the momentum principle. The momentum principle says that the total force on an object is equal to the rate of change momentum. So if it was a constant force, I could write that as the change momentum divided by the change in time. Uh, but if it's not, that's fine too. Uh, so imagine how that would work. Here's some object moving with the momentum. P1 is actually moving to the left. And a little bit later, I know I put it to the right. Uh, there's a force pushing on it, so a little bit later, after some time interval delta t, it has a new momentum p2. That change of momentum p2 minus p1 is dependent on the force. And yes, it depends on the mass because the momentum depends on the mass. This is technically the same as Newton's second law, but it just just hold on, just just work with me here, okay? So what about collisions between two objects? Suppose I have some object I'm called mass a, and then it is moving and it collides, comes in contact with mass B. Uh, what happens? Well, first of all, there's a force that B exerts on A. And I'm gonna write this as a vector force B dash A. So it's the force that B pushes on A. Well, but it's a contact, so actually A also pushes on B in the opposite direction. That's what happens. Inter forces are an interaction between two objects, so they, have, they both exert a force on each other. Let's look at car A and use the momentum principle. So the momentum principle says that the force on A is the rate of change of momentum for object A. And then we could do the same thing for car B. The force on B is the delta P B divided by delta T. But those forces, F B on A and F A on B are equal and opposite. That's what's true for interactions. Forces come in pairs. So FBA is the exact opposite of FAB. If I use, then that means there's a relationship between the changes in momentum. I can just say this. If they have the same time interval, then their, moment, their changes in momentum have to be equal and opposite. So the change in momentum for A has to be the exact opposite of the change in momentum of B because the forces are equal and opposite. Uh, if you want, you can move that momentum B to the other side and just write it as the change in total momentum is zero or if you want, you could write it as this, PA1, which is the momentum of A before the collision, plus BB1, which is the momentum of B before the collision, has to be equal to the momentum after, PA2, which is after, and PB2 after. So the momentum before is equal to the momentum afterwards, afterwards. And we call this conservation momentum because momentum does not change over the interaction. It's the same before as it was afterwards. Let's use this in an elastic collision between two carts of equal mass. Uh, th these are two carts. They have actually a magnetic bumper between them. Uh, so it looks like they don't interact, but they, they effectively do. Uh, and so here is my conservation momentum equation. I already said that. PA1 plus PB1 equals PA2 plus PB2. And that says momentum is conserved. But for an elastic collision, we also have this statement. This says that the kinetic energy of A before the collision plus the kin <coughs> kinetic energy of B before the collision is equal to kinetic energy of A after plus B after. And we, and we call that conservation of kinetic energy, and it's only true for elastic collisions. And of course, we define kinetic energy as one-half mv squared. Now, <coughs> I'd just like to point out here that 
v is a, a vector. So technically what we do is we find the magnitude of that vector and then square it. But we'll always write that as a v squared because we're just too lazy and that's fine. It's, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine, right? Okay. So here are two carts in one dimension. So I can just write these velocities as scalar values or in the x direction. And I have car A coming towards car B and car B starts at rest and they're going to collide. So that's, I'm using this bar to represent time, right? So now we're after the collision. So after the collision, uh, car A has some velocity, VA2. I don't know what it is. And car B has some velocity. I don't know what it is. We're going to find out what those are. So this is my conservation momentum equation. So the momentum before MA VA1, car B has zero velocity, so it's just zero times MB, and then MA VA2 plus MB VB2 for afterwards. My kinetic energy conservation equation says this. I left off the car B's kinetic energy because I was, I was lazy. One half MA VA1 squared is one half MA VA2 squared plus one and a half MB VB2 squared. So the kinetic energy before is equal to kinetic energy afterwards. But I said that the masses were equal. So all these masses are the same. So all th the masses are all the same. So that means that in that momentum equation, I can get rid of the zero and divide both sides by the mass and I get a simpler equation, VA1 is equal to VA2 plus VB2. I can do the same thing for the kinetic energy. The one halves cancel and the masses cancel. So I get VA1 squared plus equals VA2 squared plus VB2 squared. But again, I don't know VA2. I don't know VB2. And that's one of fine. But that's the two equations I want to solve for. I have two equations. I have two unknowns. Let's get to it. So here are those two equations. I flipped the order just because. So the second one says VA1. And the first one says VA1 squared. So let's square both sides of the second equation. So if I do that, I get VA2 squared plus the cross term twice, 2A VA2 VB2, and then VB2 squared. And then the first equation also has VA1 squared. So I can set those two equal to each other. So VA1 squared is VA2 squared plus VB2 squared, but it's also equal to VA2 squared plus that cross term plus, plus VB2 squared. Well, I can start canceling some stuff here. So there's VA2 squared. Here's VA2 squared. Canceled. VB2 two squared. Canceled. So now I have this. Zero, that's all that's left on the left-hand side, is 2VA2 VB2. Okay, so that's, that's my equation. That's what I'm stuck with. So there are a couple of options to solve this equation. Number one, that's the equation I want to solve. I could say VA2 is zero. If VA2 is zero, I multiply that by VB2, I do indeed get zero, so that works. That's fine. I could say VB2 is zero. That says the velocity of the second car is zero after the collision. And if I put that in there, algebraically it works. But that means that the target cart, the cart that was stationary, stayed stationary. It was stationary and then after it's still stationary. And, and that's like, it never even got hit, right? That it works. It's a solution, it's just a boring solution. It's like the car missed, okay? Uh, and then I also have this solution. I could say, what if VA2 and VB2 are zero? That works in this equation, but over here, this equation says uh, VA1, which I know is moving, has to be equal to some value. So those both can't be zero. It doesn't, then momentum is not conserved if that's true. So I, I don't want to use that one. So that leaves me with this, VA2 is zero, and if I use that in my momentum equation, then VB2 has to be equal to VA1. So that's what we have. So we have the car coming in, the, the launch cart stops, the, the target cart moves, and you've seen that with the pool balls that happens. This happens but with the elastic collision between two objects of equal mass. It has to be equal mass. And so here, we already saw this, but here it is again. So the red car stops and the blue car moves. And it moved a little bit, it wasn't perfect collision, but that's fine, okay. And that other cart, I was just using this other cart over here to launch the red cart. I tried to launch them all the same way, uh, but that's fine. What about an inelastic collision? So in an inelastic collision, kinetic energy is not conserved. But what happens is the two cars stick together. So if the two cars stick together, then what would their velocities be afterwards? Uh, so let's do this. That's an inelastic collision. They stuck together. And those two cars have Velcro things on them, so when they hit, they can stick together. You just have to flip them around. So here's our two cars beforehand. It looks the same before the collision. Car A and car B, they're the same mass. 
uh, and that's my little bar for stuff happens. And then they stick together. So the key thing here is that VA2 and VB2 are the same. So let's write down our conservation of momentum equation. So MAVA1 plus zero, same as before, is MAVA2 plus MBVB2. Again, the masses are the same, so the masses cancel. So I get VA1 equals VA2 plus VB2. That's the same as I had before. But now I have the other constraint. VA2 is equal to VB2. They have the same final velocity. If that's true, I can substitute in, as they're stuck together, I can substitute in, instead of writing VB, I'm going to write VA2. So I get VA1 equals VA2 plus VA2, or 2VA2. And if I solve that for VA2, I get VA2 is equal to one half the initial velocity. And that's also VB2, we already said they're the same. So the two cars come together, they stick together, I put a box around this because it's important, and they move at half the speed. But that's only if the two cars start with the same mass, this is a special case. Okay, what about something that's not elastic and not inelastic? So remember, elastic kinetic energy is conserved. Inelastic, they stick together. But it's possible to make a collision that's neither of those two. And this is what that would look like. So here's my two carts. Now they're going to hit. And you'll notice that the red cart doesn't stop, right? It continues moving forward too. And the little creeper car comes into, and there's me, because I'm resetting things because I didn't turn the video, and you don't need to see that. Okay. What if the, they don't have the same mass? I'm going to show you a couple examples here. What if they don't have the same mass? Again, it doesn't work that where the red card just stops. This is an elastic collision where the launch card has extra mass. You can kind of see it right there, extra bars on that mass, uh, and boom. Now they, they, it doesn't stop. They both move the other way. The blue card actually moves a lot faster. Uh, what if the, the target card has extra mass? Again, we don't get that same situation. It, kinetic energy is conserved. Uh, but that's that. So I'm, I'm not going to solve all those problems. I'm just showing you what happens if you change the masses then, or if it's not elastic or if it's not inelastic. How do we make a model for this? Okay, so imagine that I have these two cars. Here's my red and my blue car. Imagine that they overlap a little bit. And when they overlap, I can say that there is a spring pushing them apart. And that's not, that's not crazy, right? It's kind of true. And if I do that, I can say that this overlap distance is S, uh, and I want to find that. So the way I'm going to model this, I'm going to have the center of the two carts as the position of the carts. So this vector RAB is important. It's the, the distance, it's the vector from the middle of A to the middle of B. And then I have the length of the cart. So I want a relationship between the length of the cart and RAB to find S. And so, uh, you can see here, if, the, if they're compressing a spring, uh, B is going to push on A that way, A is going to push on B that way. And I can write the following expression for the magnitude of those two forces. It's going to be the K, the spring constant, times the compression S. And that compression S is the magnitude of RA minus the length L. Is that backwards? It's actually backwards. I think that'd be backwards. You get a negative sign there. But I, it does, it's OK, because I said magnitude, right? So. I didn't, I didn't cheat. So, but the problem is that as that compresses, then they're going to have a force and it's going to keep moving and the force is going to change. So I have a non-constant force. How do we deal with situations with non-constant force? And the answer is to break them up into small time steps. So let's say I look at the, the forces on car B. This is the momentum principle for car B. And, and if I, I can write the change in momentum for B as B PB2, which is hard to say, PB2 minus PB1. So PB2 is the momentum of the car after the some time step, at the end of the time step, not the collision. And PB1 is at the beginning of the time step. So the difference in those momentums is my delta P. Now, if, if delta T is really small, I can assume that this force is constant. It's totally not constant. Okay, I'm just making that assumption that it is so that I can do this problem. And if I do that, I can solve for PB2. PB2 is the initial momentum, PB1, plus that force times delta T. And we call this the update momentum step. I'm going to update the momentum over that short time interval. And then delta T, let's say it's one one thousandth of a second. Okay. Now I can also define the velocity as the change in position. So I'm using R for position. RB is the vector position of car B. Uh, 
The velocity is the change in position over time. And again, I'm going to assume that it's constant, even though it's not. And I can do a similar thing to find the position of the car at the end of the time interval, RB2. And it depends on the velocity, uh, which I wrote as the momentum divided by the mass, multiplied by delta T. And we call this update position. Okay, so I just need to redo this for car A, because I have two cars, they both have forces acting on them. And, and since I want to do it, let's say, a, for a second, and delta T is 1 1,000th, that's, that's 1,000 times for both cars. So it's 2,000 steps. Uh, and I don't want to do that. No one wants to do that. But Python will do that. Okay, so here's a Python program that does exactly that. Um, this is part of the program. I didn't show you everything. Um, but I'm going to show you how it runs. So this is a loop going over time. I have a time step of just uh, 1 100th of a second, 0 0.01. Uh, so here in line 18, RAB is the vector from car A to car B. So it's car B minus car A. That's that vector. That's that vector R. And I want to see if that vector shows that they're overlapping. If they're not overlapping, I want the force to be zero. So I'm gonna, every time I go through, I'm going to set the force as equal to zero, the force of car A on B. And then if it's not, if they're overlapping, I'm going to change it to this which is the value of the force due to the spring. So I have that compression minus the length, and that norm RAB is just a unit vector, so I can get a vector value for FAB. And then in line 22, I update the momentum for car A, update the momentum for car B. 24 and 25 updates the positions, and then update time. And you just keep doing that over and over again, and it works. I'm using... Uh, Web v Python. So Web v Python has these three-dimensional tools to, to make uh, three-dimensional animations, which is super awesome. And this is what it looks looks like. So there's my two cars. And the cool thing is that I can reproduce what actually happened, uh, but by breaking it into small steps and doing this update momentum, update position, and you can see that it does indeed work. What if I want an inelastic collision, how do I model that with forces? Well, in, in the previous collision, once they know over, once they don't, they stopped overlapping, there's no force. The only difference here is once they come in contact, the force is always there. So it, if it, if it leaves, if they're no longer in contact, there's still a force pulling them back together. So you'll see here that I, I had to increase the spring constant, but there's a little bit of shaking in order to make them stay together, but it, it mostly works. And they move away with the velocity of half the initial velocity. So it, it still works. Uh, what about an in-between collision? In this case, the trick here is to say the spring constant for when they're colliding is greater than the spring constant pushing them apart. So that that work done by the spring when it pushes it out isn't as great as the work done on the cart to compress it. So you lose energy and you get a, a, an, just a normal collision. And you'll see that that red card doesn't stop. Okay, now I can use this for Newton's cradle, because that's what I started with, Newton's cradle. I only used three balls here because I got lazy and I didn't want to draw. I think that the, the, the video above has five balls, but it doesn't really matter. So what's going to happen here? This is just like a car, except that now I'm using the radius of the ball to see if they overlap. And so I'm going to make a force between this first ball that's moving in and that ball if they overlap. And then there'll be a force between this ball and that one if they overlap, and this one and that one they overlap. And they do overlap. Okay, because it's not a perfect model. I wanted to, to make it be able to be seen. And, and we want to see, does it work? Does it shoot that last ball out and the other one stop? And each collision should do that. So overall, it should do that too. And it works, right? When, when you build a model for something real and you, get, you can reproduce it, then that's a good sign that you really understand what's going on. Now, just for fun, I can do something like this where you, it may be difficult to see, but all those balls, the three balls, aren't completely in a straight line. And now when those forces interact, they're, they're going to push them off, off axis a little bit, and it's not going to work as well. So let's run this one. You see? Now, in a real Newton's cradle, they'd be attached by strings, but just to show you that we don't get the same effect if it's not completely lined up. Uh, and that program is no different than the previous one, except the the positions of the balls are just shifted off a little bit. That's the only difference. Now, I did this for um, a video with the slow-mo guy shooting a, a smaller mass ball at a Newton's cradle. And so what would happen if I have a sm slightly smaller mass ball over here? Remember, in order for that 
situation where the launch cart stops and other ones moves, they have to be the same mass. So if they're not the same mass, it doesn't quite work. And you'll see there, it doesn't, doesn't quite work. Okay, so, but again, if you can model this and you really understand it, and, and this is just an introduction to these collisions, I'll make a better video later going over the details of how to make that Newton's cradle in Python, but hopefully that gives you a little sense of collisions, especially collisions in one dimension, elastic, inelastic, and in between. I'll talk to you later.